Okay, so let me ask you a question. I have a question for you. Here it is. Waves in what? I've convinced you that light travels as a wave. We talked about its wave-like properties, its frequencies, its wavelengths. If it's a wave, it has to have a medium. All waves travel in a medium. Sound waves travel in air, water waves travel in water, spring waves travel in a spring. What does a light wave travel in? Anyone want to guess? I heard vacuum. I'm going to go with that because that's the wrong answer, so let me address that first. Even your textbook probably says light waves travel in a vacuum. The definition of vacuum is the absence of a medium. Vacuum is no medium. So a wave cannot travel in a vacuum. It has to be something else. So you want to take another guess, anyone? It's its own, almost. It's not a gravitational wave. It's, it's not a particle, it's a wave. So I think I heard electromagnetic wave. Yeah, we call it the electromagnetic spectrum. Why that complicated word? It's a wave in the electromagnetic field. The what? So, you're all familiar with the gravitational field, right? It holds us to the Earth. Gravity is a force. It's a force of nature. There are four fundamental forces in nature. One is gravity. Two work on very small scales. Uh, hold the nuclei of our atoms together and responsible for radioactive decay. The other force of nature is the electromagnetic force. And it's a force between charges. And there's a field associated with that. Gravity waves, which are, it's going to be a new window on the universe, are ripples in the gravitational field. Light is a ripple in the electromagnetic field. We have to talk about what the electromagnetic force is. It has two components, the electric component and the magnetic component. Let's focus on the electric component first. Initially, they were thought to be separate things, but it was realized over the years that they really are two sides of the same force. And it's often easier to think about the electric component, so let's start with that. Actually, let me go back one slide. So, the electromagnetic force is a force of nature. There are four fundamental, and then four, with four fingers. Forces of nature, gravity, we all know about gravity. It's always attractive. You have different masses, it's an attraction between masses. The electromagnetic force can be attractive or repulsive, it's a little bit different. There are two things, we call them charge, but we could call it anything. We denote it plus and minus, but we could call it black and white, or up and down, any, any pair of opposites would do. And once we pick one to be the positive charge, then all the others have to be the negative charge. There's no special reason why one is plus and one is minus. We just had to pick one. Uh, protons have a positive charge, electrons have a negative charge, and opposites are attractive. Opposites attract, that's where that phrase comes from. Same charges are repulsive. They want to move away from one another. So it's kind of a two-sided force. It can be attractive or repulsive. There are two charges. The gravitational force, you can think of a single charge, if you want to call it that, and that's mass, a single unit of attraction. Okay, so let's consider a case of a proton and electron here. Any charge, just like any mass has a gravitational field around it, any charge has an electric field around it, and it's denoted here with the red lines. We often just draw lines to help us think about it. If the lines are more concentrated, that means the, the field is stronger. In that region, the electric force will be stronger. Just like uh, around a gravitational body, if you're close, the gravitational force is stronger. The farther away you go, the lower density the lines become, and that's denoting a weaker force. In fact, it's a 1 over distance squared force, just like gravity. The equation looks just the same, except instead of two masses, you have two charges, and you have a different constant proportionality. But it's 1 over distance squared, the dissipation of the force with distance. So here we have a positive charge, and we have a negative charge over there. It feels the force, and it's going to want to move towards the positive charge. But sometimes uh, charges aren't free to do that. Uh, so here we have a metal rod, and in this metal rod we have um, atoms of whatever type. It's probably aluminum. And the nice thing about metal is charge can flow through it. Well, it's maybe a nice thing. Have you ever stuck a like a something in an electrical socket, like a butter knife? Yeah, I did that actually. I mean, that's why my no, never mind. Uh, 
I, I did do that as a kid. So I learned about the properties of metals and electricity flowing through it at a young age and became a physicist, I guess. But uh, no, don't try that at home. But electric charges can flow through metals, but they can't hop off the metal. I mean, under a strong enough attractive force, it, it could. But generally, it'll flow through without popping off. So if I take, let's say, the styrofoam ball is a positive charge. Now I raise it up here, and I have some free electrons that can move throughout this metal. Where are they going to go? Yeah, they're going to go up to the top. Now if I move the charge down, where is it going to go? They'll go down here. There'll be a delay. It doesn't happen instantaneously. No force happens instantaneously. The force is felt over a period of time corresponding to the, uh, the speed of light traveling from the one charge to the other charge. But if I move this up and down and up and down, it corresponds to me changing the direction of the field. So sometimes, if I have the charge up here, the field's coming from up high. If I have the charge down here, the electron feels the field and the force coming from down low, and it adjusts. So if I just take this positive charge and oscillate it up, down, up, down, I'm sending a ripple, a wave, through the electric field all the way to the electron, and it then feels it and responds by oscillating itself. So this is... This is light. I'm sending a wave through the electromagnetic field. The medium is the electric field. Let's see what's next. Oh yeah, so here's, I mean that seems kind of strange, but you make use of this every single day. Now this is, you can think of this as an antenna. You have them in your cell phones, you have them on your cars, it's just a piece of metal. There's charge in there. And here we have a picture of a cell phone tower. All that they're doing is oscillating charge. And then the electrons in your antenna oscillate in response to it. And you can encode information in a way, as we talked about. We could modulate the amplitude. Maybe the cell phone tower moves the charge with a big amplitude and then a small amplitude. A big amplitude and then a small amplitude. You can encode information there. That's amplitude modulation, AM radio. You can modulate the frequency. You can have high frequency oscillations and slow frequency oscillations. High and slow and encode the information that way. Frequency modulations, FM radio. Uh, your cell phones, they all have a little antenna in them. It used to be that uh, they would uh, pull out, but now they're just built right inside of them. And so you can uh, receive, you can also transmit that way. It's an alternating current. If the electron's going up and down, it's an alternating current. We can detect that and decode that. Okay, so that's the electric field. Now, a couple hundred years ago, we realized that whenever you have an electric field, you're going to have a magnetic field. Changing one produces the other. So take just a simple circuit, like a battery with a loop of wire. The electrons are going through that wire back into the battery, so it's going around and around and around. So we have an electric current. You will automatically get a magnetic field. You've got moving charge, and so you're going to get a magnetic field. It's going to point in which direction? Does anyone know? Perpendicular, up, down. So if charge is going this way, you generate a magnetic field this way. You can't have one without the other. Change in the charge produces a magnetic field. And a good example of that is the Earth itself. If you go down to the core of the Earth, not the very center, that's solid, but the next layer out is liquid. It's liquid iron, which is a metal. And as we've established, electrons can flow through metal. And because the Earth is spinning, you set up all these little eddy currents where the material is kind of sloshing about in little circles. Well, that's charge moving in circles, so you have currents down there, and every little eddy current that you have is going to produce a little magnetic field in the perpendicular direction. And they all add together into a gigantic magnetic field, the planetary magnetic field. So that's just an example of you have one, you have the other. They always go together. And this is a good way. And I said the electromagnetic force is much more powerful than the gravitational force, and I can demonstrate that pretty easily here. I got some magnets, and so here's a magnet. It has mass, and so it's attracted uh, to the Earth because the Earth has a lot of mass. There's gravitational force between it. Here with just another magnet, a puny amount of mass compared to the mass of the Earth, I'm going to defeat the entire gravitational field of the planet and lift this magnet using the electromagnetic force. I just made it sound really cool, but you've all done this before. See that? It's magic. I overpowered the gravitational field of the whole planet. And that just goes to show 
that the gravitational force is really weak. It takes the mass of an entire planet to build up enough attraction to equal the attraction between these two magnets. Uh, it goes sideways. Yeah, so again, magic explained. Okay, let's see. The one more picture here, just wrapping up this way of viewing light. You walk up to a physicist and say, light, and automatically this pops into their head. So, and if you want to mess with the physicist, you can do this. Go up to them and say, light, and they start thinking about this diagram. To a physicist, this is what light is. It's an oscillation in the electromagnetic field. There's an electric vibration, there's a magnetic vibration, they're perpendicular. The wave travels through the electromagnetic field at the speed of light, but you have this kind of dual oscillation. So we need to start thinking about light in these terms. At least when it's traveling, we said it's traveling as a wave. This is the wave. That is the medium. 